So today's message I t entitled Dangerous Journey. And Daniel commented, he says, oh, that doesn't look dangerous, that looks fun. Well, yeah, it would be, but let's imagine for a moment that you're not setting off just for two or three hours, but you're going to go on like a two-month hike across Alaska. And you're just getting ready to start out, and your plan is to travel light and kind of live on the land, you know, find food along the way. But, you know, there's a lot of dangers out there. There's a lot of things out there that could go wrong. You know, you, you could fall and get hurt, and you might not be able to get any medical help. You know, you might meet a bear or something, you know. <laughs> There's many different things that can happen. Or you just might get sick along the way and not be able to finish the journey. And how would you get out of the mountains and the forest, you know, if you were sick. And a lot of different things out there. And so you have to prepare. You have to plan. You have to think, well, what am I going to need? And you have to measure, you know, how much can I carry before it starts to weigh me down and slow me down too much? And what do I need? What can I do without? Well, I'm going to need a map. I'm going to need a compass. That's for sure. I don't want to get lost in the woods or in the mountains. I'm going to need a, a water purification kit because I can't carry enough water for the journey. So I have to go along the way. I'm going to need a little bit of basic medical stuff, you know, a little bit of first aid kit. You have to think, of, what am I going to need? So you think about what are the dangers, the risks, the possible problems out there, and, and what can I do, you know, to keep myself safe and enjoy the journey and not get hurt. But it's not easy to decide how to pack for a journey. It's not easy to make those decisions. You have to really think carefully item by item. Because you don't want to have something you carry the whole trip and never use for anything. That's kind of useless, probably unless maybe it's the first aid kit you're hoping you won't have to use the whole trip. At the same time, you don't want to get out there and discover all of a sudden that there's something you really, really need that you don't have, like a lighter to light the campfire to cook the salmon, you know? <laughs> Salmon's good, raw, we all know that, we live in Japan, but sometimes you want to cook it, you know? <laughs> well. Let's think about not just like a two-month trek, you know, through Alaska or through the forest and the mountains, but the journey of life. What dangers do we face on life's journey? What do we pack or prepare for life's journey? What do we have to be concerned about? Well, there's a lot of things that happen in life, you know. We all have either experienced or at least read in the news, you know, tsunami, hurricane, tornado, earthquake. Now, some of those things individually we may feel like we can't do very much to prepare for. But in society, we can do quite a lot. We can build our buildings stronger. We can try to protect our cities, you know, with good architecture and uh, sea walls if we need them. In Missouri, where I lived, everybody wanted to have an underground room, a basement, so you could go downstairs for safety when the tornadoes would come. Of course, a hurricane, a lot of times you know it's coming, a hurricane or a typhoon, you can move out of the way. You know, you can plan, but you can at least make sure everything at your home is tied down and not going to blow away and try to keep yourself safe. So there are a lot of different things we can do. And of course, we can make sure we've got some extra water and some food supplies in the home and different things like this. But we really spend a lot of time and effort in society and even individually thinking about how do we prepare for these kind of disasters and things. And, and what do we do to keep ourselves safe in the journey of life? Because we don't know what's around the next corner, or what's going to happen next week or next year. We have to be as ready as we can be. And then we also have a lot of man-made dangers, things that are not from nature, but are just because direct results of human engineering or human sin. Uh, we have crime, of course, and that's a threat in many areas of the world very much. In Japan also, although not as much in Japan as it would be in some parts of the world, but it's definitely an issue everywhere. And the threat or presence of war is always a major issue in human life. Unfortunately, uh, human beings never seem to get tired of going to war and killing each other. It's very sad, but it continues to happen. And then things that start out good, you know, we, we build nice cars and things and nice roads, but sometimes it goes wrong and we have accidents and people get hurt, you know, or even die in car accidents and things. So there's a lot of dangers that are man-made. 
you know, I put the danger high voltage up, you know. Uh, our electrical systems include lots of dangers as well, not just actually getting shocked by the electricity, but from the uh, power plants and stuff. Regardless of whether nuclear or gas or coal or solar, they each have their own unique dangers and risks in building and operating those power plants. Now, one thing that I've noticed the last uh, recent years is there's more and more attention and concern about a particular risk of terrorism. How many people ever worry about terrorism? Do you ever worry about terrorism? Ma, ma, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, it's, it's, a, it's an issue, it's out there. Uh, this map shows the location of terrorist incidents from 1970 to 2015. And they counted 157,520 incidents of terrorism. Now, not all of these incidents resulted in deaths. Uh, sometimes people set fires or plant bombs or things and it ends up nobody actually gets hurt. But the motivation is simply to frighten or scare people into a particular way of thinking or a particular action or to deter them from doing certain things. So terrorism really is a concern. But how big a concern is it compared to all of these other concerns? <clears throat> well, I found this little chart here. And it shows the global deaths from terrorism from 1970 to 2017. And worldwide, the, the worst year was 2014. And 44,490 people, they counted, died of terrorist incidents in 2014. So that's quite a few people. That's definitely a concern. But most years were much, much lower. Uh, and you can see here from 2017 is, is it's going back down for some reason there was a big spike and a certain amount of that was due to you know the things going on in Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan where you sort of have war and terrorism mixed together and sometimes they're not sure how to classify things you know should it be called terrorism or is it just war you know and different things but there are quite a few incidents there are quite a few deaths but compared to other things, you know, how big a concern really is terrorism? It's a concern. But for example, compared to mosquito-borne illness, there are over a million deaths annually from mosquitoes. So even in 2014, the very worst year for terrorism, globally, an individual person is 22 times more likely to die from a mosquito bite than from a terrorist action. You know, and so you might be better off investing in mosquito repellent than terrorist repellent. <laughs> You're more likely to need it to keep your life safe. Uh, that doesn't mean that terrorism isn't a concern. It very much is. But sometimes we have to think about what's in the news does not always reflect what's the best priorities, logically or sensibly. As a matter of fact, if you look at the top 10 global causes of death, they're all health related until you get down to road injury, which is uh, down, you know, there at number eight is road injury, which is the traffic accidents and the things of this nature, transportation issues. Everything else is health related. And when you talk about the mosquitoes, you know, if they were on this chart, they would be number 17. This is just the top 10. And terrorism would be way down there in the hundreds of, you know, uh, very low in terms of global causes of death. Uh, so it really looks like, if you look at this, like we should be much more concerned about health than about how to address health issues. And of course, nowadays, there's another thing that is in the news sometimes that people are concerned about, and it's a real concern, is what they call extinction level events, things that could wipe out the human race, you know, entirely, or maybe even all life on the planet. So what sort of things could wipe out the whole human race all at once? Any thoughts? Anything you've seen in the news or maybe the movies could wipe out the whole human race? Virus. A virus, that would be one, right? There are some viruses that have the potential to wipe out entire species. And that happens. As a matter of fact, it's happening now with a virus that's uh, actually a bacterial infection that's killing off a lot of the frogs in the world, you know, and many species of frogs disappeared. I think it's actually not virus or bacteria, it's a fungus. And they're losing many frog species. So something like that, a fungus or virus or bacteria, 
Another one that comes up sometimes that they like to make movies about in recent years. There you go, the meteor strike. You know, a giant rock from space comes and hits the Earth, and uh, scientists are pretty much uh, in agreement that this is what happened to the dinosaurs, pretty much, is there was a, a giant meteor strike hit the Earth, you know, and it changed the climate, and it changed all the conditions, and wiped out the dinosaurs. And they spot, you know, large rocks coming toward Earth all the time. Now that we have big telescopes and things, we're more aware of this. Used to be that nobody knew it was coming, so nobody worried about it. And if it hit them, then they still didn't worry about it because they weren't there anymore. But you know, now we have studies. We call these uh, concerns near-Earth objects. You know, things that are close enough to Earth that they might hit the Earth or fall on the Earth. And there's quite a bit of work involved in uh, studying this and looking at it. You know, this is a conference advertisement. You know, it's going to look for near-Earth objects and how to detect them and, and what to do about it, how to respond, assess the risk, you know, and respond to that. So this is a real concern. And, uh, you know, there are companies, there are countries, you know, spending money on how would we stop a giant rock that was coming to hit the earth. Could we stop it if we detected it in time? Could we hit it with the rocket? Or in one movie they send astronauts out there to dig a hole in it and plant a nuclear bomb to blow it apart. Probably not a good strategy, but it made a good you know, movie for some people. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of different concerns, you know, uh, from the mosquito, you know, to the giant rock from space. If we want to, we could spend a lot of time worrying about these things. And they are worth having some concern about. As some risks are more predictable than others, we should also consider. You know, there's what they call low volatility risks. And that's year to year, it doesn't change much. Your risk of dying from cancer or heart attack or mosquito bite doesn't change that much year to year. It's pretty steady. On the other hand, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, terrorism, a meteor strike, this could completely change the risk so that one year is much worse than all of the years before or after it. But in all of this, we have to ask, are we really worried about the right things? Are we prioritizing things? We do want to prepare and be ready for things. And, you know, we have to assess risks and priorities. We have to ask, you know, how do we spend our money? How do we spend our time? But in the end, life isn't all about just avoiding risk, right? There's a lot of other things to life besides avoiding risk. So a large part of our time, a large part of our energy, our money, we really want to spend on things that give us joy. And, you know, to be honest, you know, most people don't find much joy in avoiding disaster or worrying about how to keep themselves healthy. They find joy in other things. They find joy in love and community, spending time with others, you know, human relationships, they find joy in beauty. You know, so many things are beautiful in the world, and so many things are just wonderful. You know, and the a flower, you know, the smell, the texture, the appearance of a flower can, can really just be a really wonderful thing to take the time to just enjoy. And in this, we have what you might call hints of transcendence. And, and that's little whispers to us through the beauty, through the love, through the different things we experience in life, that out there, there's more. There's more than our bodies. There's more than just our, our human health and what we're doing day to day. There's something more to the universe, something more to life. You know, that gives us that sense of wonder that you can see. You know, in the city, you can't see the night sky very well, but you get out away from the city and you look up this amazing night sky and the stars and stuff, and you just stand in awe and wonder at the beauty, the majesty, the, the hugeness of it all. And here you feel like, well, maybe I'm small and unimportant, and yet there's something in the human being that responds to that. And that's something that goes beyond just, you know, the, the life of the body and things. It, it whispers to us that there's more, that we have a soul, a spirit, a purpose, a meaning to life that goes beyond just avoiding death as long as possible. And 
in the end, regardless of how it comes, we all face death. You know, it's not like we can get out of it entirely, usually. I think sooner or later, we all face death, and the question of death, we have to ask, well, what about this? Is this the end of the journey of life, or is it another stage along the journey of life? Is there something beyond death? Do we just end, or is there more? And if so, how can we understand, how can we prepare and think about the things beyond, and the things that give meaning and purpose to life, the things that cause us to experience, you know, uh, the wonder of the heavens, the beauty of a flower, the joy of love. Where does that come from? Well, if we look to the Bible, the scriptures, it tells us we have a soul, a spirit, and Jesus gave us a, a warning about our lives. He, he told us here in Matthew 10:28. Jesus said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, that's kind of a pretty scary thing. Uh, sometimes Jesus says some scary things, you know. And all of those questions about, you know, war or disaster or accident or terrorism or crime, that only touches the body, you know. But we have a soul, we have something more, and there's a life of the soul as well as the life of the body. And as we look at the Bible, as we look at these hints of transcendence, we realize that our life extends beyond death of the body, that that's just another step in the journey of life that continues. And we have to prepare for what comes after that. We have to think about that. But Jesus didn't just leave us with a warning and then, oh my, we've got another thing to worry about. No, he gave us a promise. He said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. So beyond this step of life in the journey of life that's called death, there's more. And Jesus has gone ahead to prepare a place for those that have a relationship with him, for the disciples. He's preparing a place in his father's house, which is, you know, described as a house with many rooms. You know, and this is, you know, metaphor or simile, I'm sure. But it means that we have a place. And what is more important to human longing than to have a place? A place that is ours. A place of belonging a place where we are recognized and accepted as part of a community of love. You know, this is the heart of what it means to be human. Uh, human life is not just in the mind or not just in the body. Human life is part of community and relationships and meaning and having a place where you fit in, where you belong and all of that. And Jesus also taught us, he taught us how we can find our place in that great community that extends in this life and beyond uh, death into heaven. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is, is like the gate, the doorway, the truth, and the life of how we get to that next step in that journey beyond the grave into heaven, into the Father's house, the house of many rooms where we can experience a community a joy and a love greater than anything that exists in this life, in this body. And as we come into relationship with Jesus, he, he blesses us. He says, you know, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you, give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So in relationship with Christ, you know, we still recognize the risks, the dangers of the world but we can have peace. We don't have to be troubled, concerned, or worried. We can have peace that we have a place, a place where we belong. And, you know, stepping into the grave is not the end. It's just stepping through the grave into that life beyond, into the Father's house, the house of many rooms, where we have that community waiting for us. And here and now, we can already be part of that community just by inviting Jesus into our lives and is developing that relationship with him and trusting in him and his promises, 
his blessings and you know heeding the warnings he gives as well is part of it so there's more to life than worrying about how you might die there's more to life than worrying about how we can have the most fun or something in the next day or two or find temporary happiness you know there's more there, there's a, a great community that extends from this world on into the heavens of people who've trusted in Jesus and belong together and have a place in the Father's house. So I hope that all of us will choose to turn to Jesus and to, to be part of that, to have a room in the Father's house. And I just want to pray now for that. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we turn to you and we just give thanks for the promises that you have given through Christ Jesus for the blessings that are there for all of those who turn to Jesus. Thank you for providing a way, a, a map of how to get to your home, to the Father's house. The map is simple. It has just one thing on it, Jesus. Turn to Jesus, your word says, and we will have a home in heaven with you. Help us each and every one to know how to prioritize, to assess what's important, and to make good decisions about this life and good preparations for the life beyond by walking with Christ. Bless each and every one. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.